Um, can you put this up? So this is my niece. She's two and a half years old. Isn't she cute? Well, she's, she's really adorable because I think she wants to be a doctor, as you can tell. She has this little uh, stethoscope where she just runs around with her lab coat, and she, it's really cute what she does is she takes the stethoscope and she puts, it, uh, she puts it on your heart, and then she puts it on your lungs, and she has this little routine, and then she takes an imaginary flu shot and puts it on you, and then she has her own personal Band-Aid where she just puts it on the spot, and then she kisses it so it makes you feel all better. You know, so it's really adorable what she's done, uh, uh, that whole routine. And so she's now two and a half years old, but it's really interesting as a two and a half year old because they start talking more. Like before, when she didn't know how to communicate, she was adorable, but now that she's starting to communicate better and she could actually talk, she starts talking back at you. And then when she starts talking back at you, she's not very cute anymore. <laughs> like, for example, um, like, we're at the dinner table, and I'm just hanging out with my brother and my sister-in-law, and we're having dinner. And of course, since she's the baby, she's the child, you're putting the food onto her plate. And right when you're about to put it on her plate, she stops and slaps your wrist. And she goes, no. I do it by myself. I'm like, this two and a half years old, where the heck did she get this, pers this sassy personality in two and a half years? She has the audacity to refuse food because she wants to do it by herself. She wants to do it on her own. It's crazy. But I think in the, in the same way, I think that's a good picture of what our life is like um, in our faith, in our relationship with God, where God is here to take care of us, watch over us, and look out for us. But there is a tendency and propensity in all of us to say, no, I want to do it my own way. You know, and it doesn't really matter if you're two and a half years old or you're 70. Uh, the human condition, the human issue is that we want to be independent. And we want to do things in our own way, in our own will, the way we like it. And so my question is, where does this attitude of independence come from? Well, it's really simple. It really comes back to the Garden of Eden. It really goes back to the fall when we decided to eat that forbidden fruit. And when we ate that forbidden fruit, uh, we took matters into our own hands. And therefore, when we took matters into our own hands, uh, we believe in our hearts and we believe in our minds that we need to build our life in such and such a way in order to be okay. And that such and such a life might be different to different people. It might be a certain lifestyle, a certain person. The amount that you accumulate or the amount that you do in order to be okay. And you look and you try to chase it and you build it and you try to frame it in a certain way so that you hope that it could bring contentment, security, and safety in your life. You know, and you know, the funny thing is people do chase their whole lives, and some people do get the thing that they're looking for, the, the life that they imagine. But the problem is that even though you build in a certain way, what happens is it's never enough. It really never is. And even though you built your security, your own garden in a way, without the Lord, you really end up dry and dissatisfied. And why is that? It's because the truth is, we were never really meant to sustain ourselves. We were never really meant to be independent. You know, in Psalm 42, it says, As the deer pants for living streams of water, so my soul pants for you. Uh, my soul thirsts for the living God. And in the Psalms, what he's saying is, um, so he paints a really beautiful picture about our souls that have like an unquenchable thirst, an unquenchable desire that can only be filled by God alone. That the contentment that we're looking for, the security and the safety and the sustenance that we're looking for can only be God. And really, in Him is where we find really everlasting joy. You know, like, for example, like, I know fasting is over, the Lent season is over, and we could indulge and drink, or for me at least, I could drink all the Americano that I want now. Oh, thank God. <laughs> no, but... Um, the funny thing is, we, you know, as Lent is over and the season is over, we can go back to, like, drinking that Americano, or you could go back to having that cupcake or that dessert that you fasted, but it would totally contradict the ongoing process that God has done in the past seven weeks, eight weeks of our life, you know? And what I'm trying to say is that, what I'm trying to say is that when we 
like for, from my experience and from what I heard from other people is that it's not really the same anymore when you go back to those things. Like when I was drinking like an Americano just like, the, like earlier this week, for some reason, it just didn't seem the same as it was before. And I know some of the other guys when they were like fasting like social media or whatever, it's just like, yes. You, like I'm like, yo, I'm in, are you like, um, yo, do you want to go back? It's like, oh, it's, it's, I don't, I, it's, also, it's all right. And you know what I realize is, and what I realize is that what we've been going through and what the process is, is that what we used to depend on is what we really don't really need. And the emptiness and the dissatisfaction and the things that we've been experiencing all along is really a longing for God. What we're really looking for is more of Him. And you know what? And that's why in John 15, Jesus paints a, a beautiful, intimate picture about God the Father that's a gardener, about Jesus as a vine and we are the branches. And he paints an intimate uh, picture about how the branches are dependent on the gardener and the vine to produce fruit. And in the same way that we are here to produce and we are put to be dependent on God the Father and Jesus the Son as the vine. So today I'm going to answer the question, how do I become dependent on God to sustain my life? And we're going to look at John 15 and we're going to answer that question. So look in with me. So it says, I am the true vine. Can you repeat that with me? True vine. Okay, why true vine? This is really important to understand because when Jesus is saying this to his disciples, right, and the Jewish audience is reading this and listening to this, the true vine brings them back to the Old Testament. It brings them to the prophets of old. It brings them to Isaiah where he actually established this kind of imagery or this allegory in the vine in the beginning. And in this allegory, he paints God the Father as a gardener and Israel as the vine. And he, he paints this beautiful picture of how he's tending the vine. He's taking care of the vine. He's nourishing it, watering it, uh, blessing it, and forming it in order to uh, produce and fulfill his purpose in this world. But the problem was that in Isaiah 5, uh, Israel decided not to depend on God. Rather, he did depend they wanted to depend on their own human wisdom. And they depended on their own human na- and all the other nations when there were uh, wars and nations that were trying to attack them. So they were trying to be self-sufficient. And because they were being self-sufficient and walking apart from God, they were producing bad fruit. They were rebelling and sinning. And as a result of all the things that were going on, they ended up in captivity. So here, Jesus says that he's a true vine because he's saying that He's going to be the one to fulfill God's purpose. And he re- reestablishes that, saying that the purpose and the promise of God is no longer connected to a territory or is no longer connected to a nation, but rather it's connected to a person. And whoever is in me, whoever is connected to me, whoever believes in me and knows me, is connected to that promise and connected to that blessing. And I just wanted to establish that. So let's continue. It says, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit. While every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. So the question is, why does Jesus uh, paint a symbolic picture of Father as the gardener? And it's really simple. Just like any gardener, God the Father has a goal in mind for us. Now, what is his goal? Usually, it's not like ours. Usually, our goal is to be impressive. It's to look hot. Really, it's to be amazing, and it's, it's really to find affirmation in uh, the people around us and the people in the, in the world. But then what's really the purpose of that? What's really, what, why, why would we want glory? Like, what, what would happen if we get what we're looking for, where we get the glory, and we are impressive, and the people look to us? What kind of value, what kind of lasting value does that have? It has no eternal significance. And what this passage is showing is that God the Father, he really doesn't care about how impressive we are, 
or how great we are or how much glory we get. What he really cares about is how much lasting value and how much impact that we have to the world around us, that the people around us, and to God himself. What Jesus cares about is he doesn't care about us being successful, as so much of us are wanting to be, but he cares about us being fruitful. And being fruitful is about adding value, lasting value, eternal value, rather taking away from God's goal and God's val- uh, really God's purpose. So I learned from a friend that when you prune or you uh, like trim branches in a vineyard, that you don't trim it just so it could look nice or it look, looks good. It actually has a purpose to it. So that when you're trimming and you're removing all the excess, what it does, it actually helps produce better qualitative fruit. It helps build better qualitative grapes. And the thing is, if you leave it alone, if you leave the vine and the branches as, as it is, the, all the energy that's supposed to like, bring like, that good qualitative fruit actually goes into like, excess stuff. Like You see branches extending with, diff- with other branches. You see it just stemming off into different things and adding in other ways where it really has no benefit to the plant. So what any good gardener would do, and any good, vine- uh, any good person that's taking a vineyard would do, would cut it off. And it remove all the excess and all the things that don't belong so it could actually produce the maximum fruit and the best fruit it could, it could give. And, but what's interesting about that is every time you cut something off, and every cu- time um, it gets pruned off, what happens is the, the branch's roots grow deeper and broader into the vine. And it, that's where it gets all the nourishment and gets what it can do. And I think in the same way, what God wants to do is he wants to prune away all the excess in our life, all the things that don't belong, all the idols, the assumptions, um, the expectations, and the, the misunderstandings that we have in our life so we could grow deeper and closer to Jesus, that we could actually go to him and move towards him so he could be the sustainer and the place in our life. And so we could be, go to the place where God has created us to be. Okay, so now I know for a lot of us, you know, when we think of purpose, we think that Christianity is all about God fulfilling my purpose, God fulfilling my destiny. You know, it's about building certain, a certain thing and bringing glory and doing what God has created us to be or God intended us and doing amazing things. But God really doesn't really care about what you really accumulate in this passage. It's really not about what you build or how much you build or what you do or what you so much produce more than how close you are to Jesus. See, Christianity is more about how close you are to God and how deep and rooted you are to God rather than how great or how amazing things you do. It's just in your relationship, in the depth and the closeness you are with God and the nourishment you have, just, that's just the outcome. That's just a benefit. The, re, the reality is the goal and the purpose for God is for you to be close to Jesus, to be near him. So how do I depend on God to sustain my life? I, this is the first uh, answer. The point is, trim away anything that gets in the way of your worship. Now, my question is to you guys is this. What are the things that you need to trim away that's getting away your relationship with God? What do you need to really let go of or really allow God to start trimming away or you have seen God trimming away in order for God to get, in order for you to get close to God and bring out the lasting fruit in your life? And I pray that the Holy Spirit will show you that. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. And the key word here is remain in me, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I in you, you you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. I have told you this, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. So my question is, why does Jesus keep repeating the phrase, remain? 
why does he want us to lean, remain? And that's really simple. It's clear in the passages that it's for us to be dependent on God to sustain our life. Like, what does it really mean to remain? It, to, to word remain is to ab- abide in, and in a word there is to be in a relationship with. And what kind of relationship was, is that? It's the relationship where the divine, has, the divine has with his branches. It's one where it's just totally dependent and connected with God, and that is enough for them to sustain and live their life. You know, C.S. Lewis uh, says a quote, and I hope they have it, but it says, he who has God and everything else is just the same who, as he who has just God alone. Let me repeat that. He who has um, God and everything else is the same as he who has God alone. And what is C.S. Lewis talking about? He's saying that it doesn't matter what you have or what you don't have. It doesn't matter what things that you have externally that you want, that you think can bring you security and safety and the glory that you have. If you have Jesus, you have everything. You have enough. And I think that's the tendency and the problem why it's so, some, why it, uh, it's so difficult for us to worship sometimes and to see God in our life because we're so focused on everything else. Even as believers, it's so hard to find God's sustenance and to really believe that God and joy in God and following him and loving him and even following him because we're so focused on every, everything else that we, let, we fail to realize and fail to see what God has already sustained in us and have in us and doing in our life. And I believe that if we, if we allow God to cut that off, if we allow God to really remove all those places and really see God as the source and the perpetual sustenance in forming us and changing us and sustaining our lives, I think our worship could be very vastly different. It could be transformative. And we see the blessings that God has given us. We see what he's trying to do in us. And we see what he's trying to move and form, us, form in us. And not just only have the purpose that God has for us, but the closeness and the depth that he wants within us. Because if you look in the past uh, Bible and in in everything and all the characters, it was never about God, doing, God making people do amazing things for him or apart from him. It was always about God being with somebody, with the, the man and woman of God, and doing things with him. It's about that. It's about the relationship. It's about the closeness. So how do we depend on God to sustain our life? I think this is the second point. Recognize that he is enough. Now, my question to you is, and this is more of a reflective question, is, is God enough? Is he really enough in your life? I pray that you will see that, that you would not just look your li- eyes to some, someplace else, but really look to see to God what he's been doing and how he's been sustaining and to showing you that he really is enough for your life. Now, um, to close, I just want to share a little story with you because um, this is a book that I've been really blessed by, and um, it's a book called Me, Myself, and Bob. Um, it's about this guy named Phil F- Vish- Fisher, Fisher with a V, and it's his story about his rise and fall of Big Idea Productions, and if you don't know who he is, he's the creator of VeggieTales. Now, uh, if you don't know VeggieTales, it's about uh, he created these um, characters, Larry the Cucumber, Bob the Tomato, and all these little animated uh, vegetables that share Bible stories. And his dream and his goal was to be the next Christian Walt Disney. That was his goal. That, that was his dream that he had. And in the process, he, he was going to there. He was building, man. He was building that up. Like, he, I think at one point from 1996 to 1999, it went from, his production went from 3 million to 44 million. So he was growing in his height, and he was, he was doing amazing things and producing amazing videos where all these moms and these kids would want these VeggieTale dolls and these toys and these, these videos, and it was almost in every Christian book, bookstore. But at the height, at the growth of it, all of a sudden, he gets hit with a lawsuit. And then out of nowhere, he becomes bankrupt, and he's just devastated. Everything is gone. And he's wondering, like, I don't understand. For him, in the book, he says, I don't understand. He says, if this is supposed to be something that God wants me to do, if this is supposed to be, like, obviously, I'm doing something this for you, God. It's, I want to impact your kingdom. Then why, God, did you destroy my dream? Why did you bring everything apart? 
And it's really cool. It's really interesting because in the brokenness and in the devastation and in the humility of what's going on, he came to realize that his dream was much more important than God. And what God was really doing was trimming away that dream or that desire so that he could get close to him. So in the brokenness, he realized that his value was not on building things. His value was not on producing what came out of him. And that was his value, his affirmation. But rather, he was realizing that he is his son. He is his child. And that's what Jesus was trying to do in his life. So out of that, he created another company. Out of his sonship, out of his identity and value in God, this, he created a thing called Jellyfish, Jellyfish Labs. And this is what he writes. He says, Jellyfish can't locomote. They can't choose their own course. They can't go up a little, and they can't go down a little. But to get anywhere laterally, they have to trust the current. In the same way, I am useless, spineless, without form. My ability to accomplish anything good is dependent on my willingness to dwell in the current of God's will, to wait on God and to let him supply my form and my direction, like a jellyfish. My hope for you guys and what I hope that you guys understand is that, that we would remove our will, remove what we want to even build, even for God, and really go back to a place where we're just sustained in God. And that would be our purpose. That would be our hope. That would be the, the root of what we do and why we do things. Really, like him, that we would really be jelly, jellyfish and really follow him. So will you please stand and pray with me? So uh, can you close your eyes and just uh, give your, uh, just open your hands to the Lord, please? Father, I just want to pray for everyone here. I want to pray for the body of 180. And Father, I want to pray, God, of all the things that are going in our lives, of all the things, it might be issues or just the frustration or the struggle where we find no joy. And God, I pray that it would be an opportunity to look for you. So Father, I pray that you would keep that in mind in all of us. You would give, um, paint a picture of that in our lives, Lord. And help us to understand that the reason why that we might be going through that stuff is that you might be trimming away something that doesn't belong, that's getting in the way of you because you want us to get closer to you. So Father, I pray that you would show that to us right now and you would speak to us about that.
So, Father, I want to pray. And, Lord, we want to declare that you are enough for us, God. Father, in spite of the circumstances, in spite of the struggle, or what it means to live out in faith, or what it means to be a Christian or to follow you, that we will look up to you, God, and see the supply that you have in us, Lord. Jesus, I pray, um, and we want to submit our lives to you again, that we would submit our will, our control, or whatever we think that our, our life can be like, and to trust in you that you have the best for us, that you are forming us, that you are creating us to be like jellyfish, God, spineless, formless, to know that you are more than enough for us to, and so that we know that you have the best path for us, God. So Lord, we want to declare that so that you are forming us of a, of a lifestyle of worship, God, where we could appreciate everything that you've given us and what you're supplying in us and see you and, and how you're moving in our life. So God, I want to thank you for this afternoon, for the word that's spoken, and I pray that it would just breathe life to us this week. So will you guys remain standing as we close with the benediction? And here we go. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you. And to, can you move on to the next slide, please? And bring you peace. I think that's it. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. The conclusion is still something that I'm working on, guys. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Stu Still. I'm a small group leader here at 180 Church, and I just want to welcome you all to our Sunday service. Before we get started, we have just a couple of quick announcements to go through, and we're going to start off with uh, prayer requests and praises. Um, we have a uh, text number, uh, 5397 Prayer, where we have it open to everybody to send prayer requests because prayer is a very important part of life. Um, there are so many things that go on uh, that... Um, Sometimes we can't get through on our own, and we need to ask God for a little bit of help through, the, uh, through them. And this is one of those ways that we can. We have this so that you can send in a prayer request, and other people pray for them as well, so that you're not doing this all on your own. Um, we also ask that, uh, speaking of prayers, um, Pastor Sam and Pastor Lydia obviously aren't here today. They're over uh, enjoying their 10th anniversary trip over in London right now, and they're going to be uh, over there for a couple of weeks. And they just ask that while they're over there, that we just keep them in prayer for uh, the things that God is doing in their lives, so that they can uh, be rested and rejuvenated, and God will fill them through this trip, and that they come back, you know, just ready to go and continue uh, working for his kingdom. So um, in addition to your own prayers, you can send a prayer request for that as well. And we also have this line open for praises so that when God does move in your life, you can celebrate it, and we can celebrate it with you. Uh, our next announcement is about tithes and offerings. Um, here at 180 Church, you know, keeping uh, God at the center is a very important part of our lives, and we want to do that as well through our finances. And it's a simple, easy thing to do, um, just uh, giving back a little bit of what God has given us. So uh, if you're a member here, please remember to tithe faithfully. You can tithe either at the info booth in the back, you can tithe online through Chase Quick Pay at 180 Church, uh, offering at 180church.tv, or you can uh, tithe through PayPal at 180church.tv as well. Our next announcement is about small groups. Small groups are where we meet weekly to just go a little bit deeper into the Word, to see where God is acting in our lives, where He's speaking to us, and it's a great way to not only get closer to God, but get closer to the people in the community as well. And it's a great place if you're still investigating faith, if you're not sure who Jesus Christ is and where he fits into your life, this is a great place to really find out and hear the stories that other people can tell about where God has acted in their lives. So if you're not a member of a small group, I just want to invite you to join one. You can talk with Andrew Park. We meet in the city as well as on Staten Island all throughout the week, and we can get you plugged into one really easily. Uh, our next announcement is about uh, sharing the gospel. You know, we send out our emails every week uh, with Pastor Sam's sermon, and we make it available online through YouTube, and you can share it through Facebook. And uh, Pastor Sam, like I said, he's over in London right now, and he's, he actually was hanging out with a couple over there who watch the, uh, the sermons every week uh, on YouTube over in London. So even though it seems like, oh, what, what's, what's sharing the, uh, you know, 
the sermon on YouTube or uh, on Facebook going to do. It actually does touch a lot of people's lives, and it can reach across the world. And uh, actually, uh, Pastor Billy was telling me earlier today that uh, some soccer player over there that's actually a, a semi-big name over there actually follows the, uh, the YouTube sermons there as well. I mean, you wouldn't think that, would you? But... Um, the, uh, yeah, that didn't work. Uh, anyway, but uh, yeah, sharing the gospel really does work. Uh, so we invite you to share it. You can share it on Facebook or uh, at the end of every email, you can just plug in your friend's email address and get them invited uh, on the journey as well. Those are all of our announcements today. And remember, if there's anything else about 180 Church you want to find out, you can always go to our webpage at 180church.tv. You are my freedom, Jesus, show the reason. I'm kneeling again at your throne.